Good evening, everyone. Nice to see you again. Welcome back to the fourth session of uh, GH, JGH Mini Med School. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all. Hope you've been enjoying the series so far, and I think you'll find tonight to be particularly interesting. We're going to give you all the information about information. And if you think that sounds a little confusing, just bear with us. Uh, it'll all be cleared up very soon. Um, uh, the usual drill, I'm sure you're familiar with it by now, but we would appreciate you uh, filling in the, uh, the forms at the end of the session and handing them back at the end of the series. And uh, the cell phones, the usual thing. We know we don't like anybody to be interrupted during the, uh, the session. Uh, tonight, just to let you know, Judy Bianco, who has been with us throughout the series, will be handling the question and answer period, and we look forward to having her participation as well. Um, <clears throat> just as a preliminary remark, I have just something you may be interested in knowing. This series has been dealing in a general way with geriatrics and, and aging, but it's important to note that pediatrics tonight plays an important part too, because uh, Glenn Nashen, who is the driving force behind the JEH Mini Med School, uh, became a father last Friday, so there's a little one in his family. It's his uh, first son uh, and uh, third child. And for those of you who may not know, it's all in the family because his wife, Dr. Judy Hagshi, is a member of the Herzl Family Practice Center. And his parents are um, very regular attendees here at, at Mini Med School. So they believe in keeping it all within uh, the confines of the hospital. For that, we're very happy. Um, tonight, we have a very special sponsor, WebMT. You may have seen the magazine on the information table earlier picked up perhaps some information, and we're very grateful to them for, uh, for being the sponsors tonight, and uh, particularly to uh, Dana Shamas, who's the Director of Business Development Canada, and uh, Carolyn Fournier, the Project Manager and Scientific Liaison for Canada. And I'm very happy to acknowledge as well uh, Pietro Autor, who is here from TD Insurance Milosh Monax, and we are uh, very grateful recipients of uh, their support for this entire mini-med mini series, Without everyone's help, uh, you would not be able to take advantage of the, the medical advice that you've been receiving and will continue to receive. So with that, uh, I'll introduce the speakers tonight. There are going to be three of them, uh, each speaking in turn. Uh, Dr. Eddie Lang is um, an attending physician here at the Jewish General Hospital's emergency department. His area of expertise is evidence-based medicine, which is a subject he teaches at McGill University. Uh, to medical students and to practicing physicians. In addition, Dr. Lang is the associate editor of three journals related to emergency medicine and primary care. After he received his MD from McGill, Dr. Lang completed his specialty training at the Jewish General Hospital, and he has served since 1993 in the emergency department and on McGill's faculty. Our second speaker is uh, Arlene Greenberg who is our uh, chief medical librarian here at the hospital. She has a particular interest in helping patients and their relatives find reliable health information that meets their specific needs. In the early 90s, Ms. Greenberg worked with Hope and Cope to help cancer patients locate reliable information on the internet. This service continues today, and it has been expanded to other areas in the hospital, including Gyna Oncology and the Herzl Family Practice Center. Uh, Ms. Greenberg graduated from McGill University in 1970 with a master's degree in library science, and she began her JGH career in that same year, in 1970, and she became our chief medical librarian in 1978. And Francesca, Francesca Fratti is the patient information specialist and the um, instructional librarian in the hospital's health sciences library. Along with Arlene Greenberg, she manages the hospital's patient and family resource center, which provides reliable, up-to-date inf health information. And in collaboration with the health, health professionals throughout the hospital, Ms. Fratti helps to develop patient education materials. She received her master's degree in library and information studies in 2005 from the Dalhousie School of Library and Information Studies. So these are your presenters tonight, and I believe we're starting with uh, Arlene, who will briefly introduce a video that's going to kick off the presentation tonight. <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're very pleased to see all of you here. Um, just before we start the video, uh, I just want to point out that we have handouts on the table here. We have a 
pamphlet um, for describing our Patient Family Resource Center, and we also have a pamphlet describing the cancer resources um, information that we provide um, to our uh, patients here at the hospital. And throughout the presentation, we're going to be referring to different websites. You do not have to mark anything down. Uh, we have a handout with all of the websites that we're going to be referring to and, um, and their addresses. So after the uh, session, you can come and pick this up. Okay, so we're going to start off the evening with a short video that um, shows the interaction between a doctor, a patient, played by Francesca, and uh, the librarian, myself. So sit back and enjoy this, and it'll just be a kickoff to, uh, to our talk. Hi, Ms. Jones. It's great to see you again. Hi, Dr. Lang. The last medication I prescribed for you for your fibromyalgia symptoms, did that seem to alleviate the muscle pain and the soreness? It's one of the best treatment options available. I know, it's just that I still feel pain, and, and then I also have all these side effects that I don't really like. My friend was telling me about this therapy called uh, magnetic therapy, I, so I kind of looked it up on the internet, and I found some stuff, but I'm not sure if it's really good. Hmm, magnetic therapy. I've actually heard some mixed reviews about that. I'm not sure if it's really effective. There's just so many treatments out there, it's hard to know what to choose. But I have an idea. Why don't I send you to the Patient and Family Resource Center of the Jewish General Hospital? There's a health science librarian there who can show you all of the things you need to learn about your disease on the internet and maybe think about some new treatment options that might be helpful for you. What I'll do is I'll give you an information prescription and you can call and make an appointment right away. That's amazing, Dr. Lang. Thank you. And so once I've found this information, um, should I come back and talk to you again? Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Good nice luck. Nice to see you. Hello, Ms. Jones. I'm Arlene Greenberg. I'm the Chief Medical Librarian. What can I do for you? Hi, Ms. Greenberg. Um, well, Dr. Lang um, gave me an information prescription. He mm -hmm. said that I could come here and ask you some information about fibromyalgia alternative therapies. Good. Good, so you've come to the right place. Um, this is the Patient and Family Resource Center, and we have a website. I'm going to go on to a uh, resource called Medline Plus, which is a consumer health website uh, giving links to a lot of different associations. So I think we'll be able to find what you're looking for. Oh, that's great. Ooh, first one, regular dip could benefit those with fibromyalgia. Wow. So you see here, this comes from the Arthritis Foundation. So these are reliable uh, links, and the information that we find on this site can be trusted. So let's see what they have to say. Sure. And I just want to point out um, that as a librarian, we give information. We are able to find you information on whatever it is that you're looking for, but we do not replace the visit with your doctor. So please discuss anything uh, medically related with your doctor, okay? Okay, I will. Well, I'm so glad you're feeling better. <laughs> it looks like that librarian service really worked out well for you. You got to learn a lot about your disease and learn more about treatment options. I'm going to be referring many more patients to that service now. Bye, Dr. Lang. Thank you so much. Happy swimming. You're very welcome. So now, now you see the great cooperation uh, and what you're in for this evening. <clears throat> so I'm going to start off. Hi, Ms. Jones. It's great to see you. So we start off um, why you would want to look for health information online. There are a couple of reasons um, and uh, we've laid them out here. Um, the first is, the most important thing is not to be in denial. So don't be that ostrich that you see there with your head in the sand. 
um, go out there, try to find information, try to understand what your doctor is telling you. Often when you go see a doctor, he doesn't have the time to explain everything. So we are fortunate to be able to have the internet um, with many, many health sites for you to go in and get more information. This way you participate in your health and you become a partner with the doctor in um, making informed decisions and um, hoping to have a better outcome. So there is evidence out here that shows that an informed patient is an empowered patient with the goal of achieving improved health, health outcomes. And it goes on to say that shared or information decision ma making, evidence-based patient choice or concordance, all synonyms, all explaining the idea of participating in your, um, in your health care. Uh, this study was actually uh, coming from a very a renowned journal, British Medical Journal. It was done in 2007, and the title is Effectiveness of Strategies for Informing, Educating, and Involving Patients. And the link is here, and it is in the handout, so if you wanted to go and read the article, you can. Um, evidence also shows that an informed patient is someone who is more in control of their course of treatment and if you are more in control then the anxiety that you're experiencing gets reduced and um, and this is all good so why look for health information online again the reasons are quite simple it is accessible the internet never sleeps um, it is up 24 7 you just have to go to it uh, it is free. Many of the websites coming from universities, governments, uh, associations are absolutely free and um, it's fast and it is up to date. The internet is dynamic, it is continuously updated and uh, the information is therefore current. The other reasons are you can check many Places. It's not just one. You have many, many choices, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. And we'll tell you a little more about that later. So you have the option of checking multiple sources. And the internet provides a community. It gives you um, a chance to reach out to other uh, people who are going through the same experience that you are. So for example, uh, the Canadian Cancer Society, uh, can link you up with support groups and other people uh, having a similar disease that are not necessarily in your city. They can be anywhere in the world. Uh, there's also the um, self the self help group of Greater Montreal, which you can call right here in Montreal, and that links you to support groups as well. And I should mention that our Hope and Cope um, also does that here at the Jewish General. So Statistics Canada has given us a portrait of seniors, and this is based on the census done in 2006. Thanks to us baby boomers, the aging population is expected to double over the next 20 years. So starting uh, from 2006, the aging uh, population over 65 was 4.3 million, representing 13.2% of the population. And in 2026, it will double to 8 million, representing 21.2%. They have also uh, surveyed the use of internet amongst seniors. And in 2000, it was 11%. And in 2003, 28%. And in 2005, almost six out of every 10 adult home users, not necessarily seniors, but adults, went online searching for health information. So seniors are changing, they are becoming more savvy, more internet savvy, more active, and certainly um, I think we're gonna see as, as the years go on, this is really going to increase as, as they're predicting. So I'm going to just point out a couple of general interest sites that are very trustworthy and uh, therefore I'm going to mention them here. Uh, the first one um, is Medline Plus. 
Medline Plus is the world's largest medical library. It comes from the National, it is the National Library of Medicine coming to us from the US. Um, it has coverage of over 750 diseases and conditions. Um, they have health topics, drugs and supplements, you can see over there on the left, a medical encyclopedia, dictionary, the latest health uh, in the news, directories, um, other resources, etc. And I refer to this Medline Plus in, my, in our video. There are no advertisements on Medline Plus and it is updated daily. The, uh, another uh, excellent site is the Mayo Clinic. Uh, the Mayo Clinic was launched in 1995 and it is a team of web professionals and medical experts and they give you the latest on health information from the Mayo Clinic. The WebMD, who we are very fortunate to have one of our sponsors tonight, is another excellent site and they um, provide valuable health information tools for managing your health and support to those seeking health information. They also have videos. The site is interactive, offering online community programs, and you can set up a free newsletter that can come to you as well on a topic of interest. Public Health Agency of Canada is uh, bilingual. Um, it gives a lot of information on travel and uh, regulations that uh, we as Canadians have to follow. And the last one here is CISMEF. So CISMEF comes from France. It is the acronym for Catalog and Index of French Language Health Resources and is a quality controlled health, ga health gateway of health information in French. So it is similar to Medline Plus in that it is comprehensive and a one-stop shopping site. Quebec is also a contributor of resources to this site. And here are a couple of sites special, especially um, for seniors. Uh, we have WebMed Health, Healthy Aging Guide. And here you can see that uh, they have information on healthy body, mind and spirit, um, family and friends, planning ahead, sports and resources staying active, so this is a really good place to go and get a lot of comprehensive information as well. Then there is Medline Plus again, which has a special um, section just for seniors, and Health Canada, which is uh, bilingual again, healthy living for seniors. And now I will turn over to Francesca. Thank you, Arlene. Hi, everyone. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you um, one more resource. And then after that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about evaluating health information, uh, which is very important for you to have these skills. Because um, although we recommend certain sites, and you can go to our website and see what we've recommended, chances are you're going to find yourself Googling, because everybody does it. I do it, too. Um, so you, you need to have some skills in order to be able to tell the difference between the good information and the bad when you go there. But first, we're going to visit this site. Lab Tests Online, is that too loud? Is a very useful site um, to go to if you want to know a little bit more about the lab tests that you are, uh, your doctor is ordering for you. I'm sure you all know the experience of being given a requisition and all these boxes are ticked off and you have no idea what they're for. Maybe your doctor explained it to you, but the minute you step outside the door, you forget. Um, or there wasn't really time for an explanation. So what you can do is you can come here and you can look them up. So um, you can look, they're listed alphabetically. And you can pick whichever one happens to be on your um, requisition. So let's say ANA is on there and you want to know why. What is that for? What are you looking for? So this will explain to you that it's um, testing for autoimmune disorders, and it will explain the, the test sample, a little bit about how it's, um, how it's handled and what they're looking for. It'll give you some answers to common questions. It'll remind you what you need to do to prepare for the test. 
So that can be very useful. Um, the other thing you can do is, let's say you want to know what tests should be done in order to test for a certain condition. So let's say you want to know for arthritis. Um, actually, no, this one has a little thing that's missing. This is something also to keep in mind when you're going online. Sometimes um, there will be little glitches. So I'll show you what I mean. Um, if you look for anemia, you see here there's a little list of tests that are used to tell whether you have anemia. Um, so you could go by any uh, diabetes, you can look under diabetes, it'll give you a little overview of what diabetes is and it'll tell you something about the kind of tests that's going to be done. And then the other thing you can do here which is useful is you can look at uh, what screening tests are usually done as a matter of course for different age groups. So for yourselves if you want to look what normally gets tested for when you re reach 50. Um, let's say you have children, you want to look what is normally what they should be tested for, or you have grandchildren and you want to know what newborn tests are being done, should be done. So this is a good place to go to find out everything you want. Something to keep in mind though is that it's not going to give you any information about how to um, tell what your specific test results mean. That's something that only your doctor or health professional can tell you. Every case is very specific and different. And most of these sites that we're going to show you are always going to stay pretty general because they're not supposed to replace a visit with your doctor. They're just supposed to give you general information so that you can understand better. Um, okay, and I just want to show you one last thing about this site, which is de excuse me, down at the bottom. There's this little honor code badge, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about what that means um, in a second. So that's that. So as I said before, um, something that you might want to look into a little bit is how to evaluate health information. Um, on the internet, of course, you want to be able to go to different websites and be able to tell whether you can trust the information you're getting. The same goes for books that you might be reading, books that your friends might be recommending to you. And also in the news, we get a lot of information about health in the news, and Dr. Lang is going to talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, and we want to be able to judge. We'd like to be able to trust that everything in the news is true and believable and isn't exaggerated, but it's not really true. So we need to be able to make those judgments. So these are some resources. Um, we have them on the handout so that you can look at them when you get home if you want to. And they s g sort of take you through the different criteria that you might want to keep in mind whenever you visit a website. Everything that I say about websites, you can apply to books as well. Um, news is a little bit different, and I'll talk about that in a second. So I remember I mentioned the little badge. So here we have... Uh, the Health on the Net Foundation was developed in 1995, so fairly early on in the life of the internet. It was recognized that it, because of the wonderful freedom that the internet gives, anybody can put anything up there. So that's great, except that it means that there aren't any real rules about the quality of that information. So it was thought that there should be an independent body, not affiliated with any government or any organization, that would develop a set of standards that people could follow voluntarily so that it would help others to judge the quality of the information they're putting up there. So they came up with the honor code. It's quite simple. It's only eight little things. And anyone who develops a website can apply for a certification here. As long as they follow these eight criteria, then they will get a little code at the bottom, a little badge at the bottom of their website. That's, so when you go out there surfing on the web, if you see that badge, you can trust that the site that you found is something reliable. That doesn't, of course, mean that if that badge isn't there, you shouldn't trust it. Medline Plus, which Arlene just showed you, doesn't have it. Um, the National Cancer Institute doesn't have it. There are certain organizations that are so trustworthy on their own that they don't actually need necessarily. The Canadian government, for example, doesn't need to apply for this. So keep that in mind as well. So what, what are they looking for? 
Um, you should be able to tell who the authors are, what are their qualifications. You should be able to tell right away that the site is not telling you that you shouldn't trust your doctor, that, that what they tell you is bunk and that this treatment really is going to work. Um, it shouldn't try to replace that relationship that you have. It should respect your privacy. It should be clear where the information is coming from. So if they're talking about studies, those studies should be listed. Um, any claims that they make should be claims that can be supported by evidence. Um, it should be clear where, how you can contact the people that developed it. It should be easy to navigate. Um, if there's any funding, it should be clear where that money's coming from. And also, if there's advertising, that's okay, but it has to be clear that it's advertising and not content. So sometimes advertising masquerades as something um, more reliable, so it's important to, to not have that be confused. So that's a lot of stuff to remember. As I said, these resources will help you if you want to go look. Um, evidence-based medicine for the layperson is also, we've mentioned evidence-based medicine before, you may have heard of it before and you'd like to learn a little bit more about what exactly that means, so you can go there and it'll explain it in layman's terms. Um, what I just showed you, that list of eight, that's a lot of stuff to remember. And so there's also this little mnemonic that was developed um, by uh, Elizabeth um, LaRue. She's at the um, nursing college at the University of Pittsburgh. And this was actually developed for health professionals because um, it's not just lay people that have trouble sometimes judging. Um, it's also health professionals need a quick way to judge the information that they find online. So this was developed, the SPAT. Um, and it's, it covers most of what uh, the honor code covers, but it also has a, a slight little variation. So site, of course, is it easy to navigate? Can you tell who created it? Publisher, who created it? Um, do they provide their credentials? Um, but the audience is an interesting one. It should be clear who the site was developed for, who it was directed to. And something also to remember, because we're showing you American resources and Canadian resources, and the CSMF is French, sometimes you have to keep in mind that um, in the US or in Europe, they have different standards, different drugs have been approved. So it's very important to be aware. It doesn't mean that you should ignore that information, but just be aware that it may not apply to us living here in Quebec. And then, of course, timeliness, it should be recent and up to date. And like I said, any of these things that I've just mentioned can be applied to books as well. As far as the news is concerned, it's a little bit different um, and it's a little more um, confusing. Um, one of the things um, is that often news stories will mention that the study was done, but they don't actually tell you anything more about the study. Um, they mention a university, but they don't really mention enough. This is one of my pet peeves. They don't really give you enough information so that if you wanted to read the study, you could actually go out and find it. I have a hard time finding them sometimes, and that's my, my job, my profession. I sometimes have doctors asking me because they read a, new, a story in the news and they'd like to read the actual study and they can't find it either. That's, that's not good. It doesn't mean that we are not good at finding the information. It means that they haven't provided enough information for us. So that's already an indication. Um, they should explain what type of study it was. The type of study makes a big difference in terms of the validity of the evidence. Um, if it was a study done um, and it was a very small study over a short period of time, it's going to have a different importance uh, than if it was done over a long period of time with a lot of people. And there's a lot of details about the quality of studies. The site that I mentioned to you before uh, that talks about evidence-based medicine also explains a little more about different types of studies and what makes them good or not so good. And I think that Dr. Lang is also going to explain a little bit more about that. Um, and if you want, you can actually bypass the news and you can go to these resources which provide you a synopsis and a, and a review of stories that you find in the news. So what you have here is experts and um, Dr. Lang also has a column in the Gazette 
which he's going to talk to you about, that does a similar thing, that looks at the evidence that's out there, looks at studies, and evaluates them, and repackages them in a way that makes it intelligible and understandable what that research actually means. So, like we said, it's in the handout, and you can go and take a look at those. And now, I'm going to pass you on to Dr. Lang. Good evening, everybody. So I'm going to stand here in front of the podium because I have something I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes. Uh, and I also like to be closer to the audience. So it's great to see everybody here this evening. Um, my colleagues Arlene and uh, Francesca have done a phenomenal job, I think, showing you the whole breadth of internet resources that are out there which you can use to learn more about health issues or that you can uh, use with your kids or grandkids to get them to uh, help you find high quality resources and we learned about um, how it is that we're going to identify which of those resources and which of those websites we can really trust. So that, that was fantastic. So as Francesca mentioned, the part that I want to focus in on is health and the media. Because the reality is that a lot of what we learn about health comes through TV, radio, newspapers. And what happens often is that scientists or researchers publish the results of their studies in a journal and then that leads to a press release which is then carried in, in, in the media. But there are problems with this. One problem that really bothers a lot of people is that sometimes what we hear about is contradictory. Right? Doesn't that annoy you? Is red wine good for you? Is it bad for you? It seems like every month the answer changes and that seems to happen a lot. Another problem that we are maybe not as attentive to but that comes up a lot in reporting of health research is that there is a kind of a bias in what comes out. Sometimes uh, when the publications are published, they are going to contain information which kind of exaggerates what the effect is or if it's showing that a certain treatment is better than another treatment, it might not emphasize the side effects, which are of course are very important, but which might not make the research look all that good, and so that part is given a little bit less attention, and we're given potentially a false picture. As we saw with the Vioxx controversy many years ago, sometimes it's the result of the influence of the pharmaceutical industry that can affect uh, the way that we uh, understand research and can have a huge impact on health in that it takes many years for us to realize that some of the studies which have been supported by uh, drug companies can reveal results which later turn out to be not necessarily completely true or reveal some dangers that we may not have appreciated in the first place. And oftentimes when these things are reported in the press, you'll have the journalist speaking to the researcher to find out what their studies mean and as you can imagine, even the researcher who is not even paid by the, the, the drug company is going to have a tendency to want to make his lifelong work and vision and dream look good and may not be 100% objective. So thinking about this, uh, what, it, what appears us to be one of the problems in the way that the health research is reported and what we hear about all the time in, in, on news reports is that we don't get enough context. We find out about this new treatment for the disease, but we don't know all that much about the disease. So they, there's not much of an explanation often in the media about what an illness is about, why it's important, what are the effects on your health. And we also don't know how this new study fits in with what we knew before. So we can't really tell sometimes if this is a really big advance or this is just a small study that contradicts what the previous study was were, were saying. I think though m one of the most important things to bear in mind is that not all research is equal. And Francesca alluded to this. I think one of the most powerful examples we have recently is the story of hormone replacement therapy, right? For many, many years, women were taking hormone replacement therapy for postmenopausal symptoms like hot flashes and then we learned that it's not good for you. So what happened? What happened was that the earlier studies 
were not very strong studies. They were studies that were not uh, scientifically as rigorous as the studies that came later on. So it's very important to have an understanding, and uh, this is what we're, I'll tell you what we're trying to do with this column in the, in the Gazette, to explain to the public how strong the study is, whether it's something that you can bank on, or whether it's actually kind of preliminary and there might be some changes in the future. The other problem with health reporting is that you don't Ha you, the, the health journalists can't really tell you and make recommendations about what to do with the information because they're not physicians and they can't really take that step. And as I mentioned, the researchers may have a bit of a skewed perspective on how, what they think about their, their study. So as a result of these issues, I've gotten together with uh, a, a medical journalist named Evra Taylor-Levy who, and together uh, uh, we write a column based on <coughs> evidence-based medicine, uh, and, and this comes out twice uh, a month in the Gazette, every second Tuesday, and we've been doing this for almost two years now. Uh, so evidence-based medicine is just that. It's that you want to make sure that the kind of decisions you're making in healthcare and that the doctors are making and the nurses are making for you in healthcare are not grounded on this is the way we've done it for years, or this is what I learned from this doctor many years ago, but that it's grounded in science and that it's grounded in the research that comes out and that is high quality research. That's really what evidence-based medicine is about. So what we do is we, uh, my colleague and I, we scan through all of the uh, journals and the press releases and we try to find studies that we feel are both high quality and important to a lot of people in the public and that the, the results of the study will yield or a kind of a, a decision or a something that you can act on or something that can make you healthier. Or sometimes what we do is if there's a, a story that got a lot of press in the media, but we feel that the, tr the actual uh, analysis of it would show that it's not as strong as you might think, we'll often choose that as a topic that we're gonna cover in our column. And we try to make some really concrete recommendations. This is usually in the last paragraph, so we hope people are making it to the last paragraph of the column, but we give some really uh, solid suggestions of what this means for patients, what this means for their families, and what, in actual fact, you might want to do with that information. So what I'd like to do now is I've gone over the, the years of, uh, of columns, and, cho and I'm going to talk to you about three specific ones that I think would be perhaps of particular interest to you in this audience. First one is about falls, <coughs> falls in the elderly. So raise your hand if you have uh, experienced, if you or someone in your family has experienced a fall that has resulted in a real important change in their health. Raise your hand if that's the case. All right, so we're seeing quite a few hands. Now, y you know, I, I, I've fallen lots of times and uh, you know, falling is a common day occurrence, especially when it's icy outside. But falling is a completely different kettle of fish in the elderly. And uh, what happens in the elderly, of course, because the bones are more fragile and uh, the, 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 l the health status is often not as good as in younger adults, a fall can have really dramatic consequences, both physically and psychologically. Because once you've fallen, there is a tendency for the elderly to now be very uh, cautious and apprehensive about going outdoors, especially in the winter time, and often become more and more shut in and more and more isolated. 30% of the elderly, very elderly, will fall every year, and often this is a trigger for a kind of a downward spiral in health. So as, as worrisome as that sounds, we found some research that was high quality that could uh, gave us some important information about how to prevent falls in the elderly. So we found a study that's called a meta-analysis. Uh, what a meta-analysis is, is it's not a single study, but we think it's more important than a single study because it's, it's a way of looking at many, many studies at the same time so that we have a, an understanding of the whole world literature on a given topic and that it's not just the results of one study which can always steer us wrong. So 
these researchers looked at 44 studies that tried to all look at different ways to prevent falling in the elderly. And what they found is that uh, looking at all of the different kinds of exercise and training programs, it's not, th what, the, what the, the conclusion was, and this was, uh, we felt a very strong conclusion based on a very good study, was that it's not just simple exercise programs which can prevent falls. It's not simply walking a lot, although that's very, very important. It's not going to a gym, it's not bicycling, but it's actually balance exercises that can help prevent falling in the elderly. And the earlier that you start the exercises, the longer you do them on a weekly basis, you know, maybe a few minutes the first time and then up to 10, 20 minutes the second time, this clearly has a, an effect on reducing your fall risk. And it does so more than any other kind of uh, exercise type intervention. So that's very important information and I know that the Y and the Cumming Center also all offer balance training courses to people who are interested. So I guess you're probably asking now, Dr. Lang, what are those exercises? So I'll just have you know that here at Minimed, you're not only gonna get better information, you're actually gonna get healthier by coming here. So if you want, you don't have to do this, but I'm gonna show you what that exercise is. I'm gonna ask, if you want, stand up. And it's very simple. What you do is you put both of your hands on your sides like this. And, and you might want to hold someone for support, but you just lift one leg up in the air for a few seconds. Okay, be very careful if you, if you want to hold on someone. And just by keeping one leg up for a few seconds, you're actually, and you do, oh, you're okay? <laughs> you're actually d improving your balance and doing this kind of exercise as well as other exercises on a regular basis will hopefully prevent your risk of falling. So thanks very much, everybody sit down. So, uh, j just, just, just one other thing about the exercises. That was just one example. So the arms out, one foot up, trying to control your balance. That's just one example of a balance exercise. If you go, if, if you go to the Gazette website, or you have one of your family members go to the Gazette website, for every column that we publish, it's available online. So the whole series from back to when it started is available online. And with each column, there are internet resources, uh, like the ones that, we that you, you've seen already, which show you the exact exercises that I, I was just describing to you, as well as others. So that's one topic I wanted to tell you about. Who has, uh, you don't have to tell me, if you, you don't have to show if you're shy about this, that's not a problem, but who has high blood pressure? Not surprising, very, very common. Leave your hand up if you measure your blood pressure at home. Right. So if a lot of people have high blood pressure, a lot of people have high blood pressure at home, but is there an ideal way to measure it? So one of the columns that we did, uh, you, know, you know, this is an important issue because um, there's a phenomenon that you probably have heard of called white coat high blood pressure. What that means is that the blood pressure goes up when you're in the doctor's office with the white coat, so I hope I hope nobody's blood pressure is going up right now, <laughs> but with, when you go home, the blood pressure goes down. And so the problem there is that you might receive medications to lower the blood pressure that are unnecessary and potentially harmful when in fact, if you were measuring the blood pressure at home, you'd find that it's much lower. So what's the right way to measure your blood pressure at home? Well, many months ago, uh, and we covered this in the Gazette for the Health Watch column, uh, the American Heart Association came out with some very strong evidence-based recommendations on how to do it. And in a nutshell, uh, what you, what you, you know, the, the, the pe people are very confused about this. When they come to the emergency department because they're worried about their blood pressure and we talk about this, they don't know. Should I do a single reading? Should I do it every day? Should I do it in the morning? So these are the recommendations. Uh, ideally, you should measure your blood pressure regularly over a seven day period, 
do it at rest when you're sitting and not when you're all uh, excited or anxious about something. You should do two to three readings, one right after the other. Do it once in the morning, once in the evening. Record all of that information and bring it to your doctor. That's what is felt to be the best way to monitor your blood pressure at home. So it's not to measure your blood pressure seven, eight, nine times a day when you're not feeling well. And it's not to just leave it in your drawer and let it collect dust and never even take it out. But this is uh, the, the, the way that is suggested for ideal blood pressure monitoring at home. And again, all of this information you'll find on the Gazette website as well as internet links to the original cardiac resource that uh, describes what the right wh way to do it is. Last column I want to tell you about, we came out a few months ago and it talks about Alzheimer's disease. And Alzheimer's disease, really, uh, it's got to be the most worrisome and terrible obstacle that we have to healthy aging. And, and I, I don't even have to ask for hands. I know everybody is affected by this with a family member or a parent or, or a relative. And as we see, as, uh, it, it's just uh, a, a something that we're working very hard on to, to treat and to prevent but it's still affecting a large percentage of the patients who are over 85 years. And needless to say, it, it's, it's a family illness. It affects the whole family, the children, and it, unfortunately in the emergency department, we see the ravages of Alzheimer's and, and how it uh, affects patients' autonomy and the ability of families to care for, for loved ones. But can it be prevented? Well, it can't be completely prevented. But what uh, is out there that's proven, that's evidence-based, that reduces the chances of developing Alzheimer's? Anybody know? Anybody want to know? <laughs> so is it diet? Is it exercises for the brain? You know the, those puzz crosswords puzzles? There are medications out there. You've heard of Aricept. Will that prevent Alzheimer's? There is probably one treatment that's proven over all others, and it's not on that list. The answer comes from Australia. And in Australia, they recruited 100 or I think 200 elderly patients in their late 60s who were starting to have concerns about memory. And they conducted what's called a randomized control trial. That's the most, that's one of the highest kinds of research. And it's, it's strong and, it, and the results of that kind of research usually help us to know what is the right thing to do. And so they took these 200 patients, they tossed a coin for each one, and if it was heads, they went into an exercise program. And if it was tails, they went and they got some pamphlets about uh, other kinds of, uh, of activities, but not about exercise. And then they retested these gr this group of people for memory and for their, their ability to function well over a several months period, and the results were quite remarkable. Exercise had actually a pretty impressive effect on improving memory and preventing what might be the beginnings of Alzheimer's in the elderly population. So people who were doing regular walking, biking, going to the gym and getting their heart rate up were much less likely to develop memory problems than the comparison group. And this is uh, now in published in practice guidelines. So very important information and probably much stronger evidence than anything on the brain puzzles or the, uh, the diet or the medication, although sometimes those things are important and effective too. So uh, that's about it. Uh, I, I invite you to please send, uh, you know, the other thing about the Health Watch column is that we like as much as possible, uh, th th we choose subjects that we feel are important to a lot of people, that are represent good evidence, that will result in a health change for a lot of people, but we also like to choose things that were suggested to us by the public. So that's our email address, healthwatch at canada.com, and 
go home tonight, have someone in, have, write us an email or send, have someone in your family send us an email about what subjects you think are important and that you want us to cover in the uh, near future. So um, in case you were wondering if you had to remember all of this, the answer, of course, is no. That's why we are here, and that we being the Patient and Family Resource Center. So we are located um, in the library up on the um, second floor, Pavilion A, room 200. That's the Cote de Neige entrance. You can see here we have a lovely reading area, comfortable. We welcome all of you to come. Uh, you can drop in. We have uh, bookshelves of um, general, a small collection of general books. Uh, we do have books on cancer, and they are all kept in the uh, Hope and Cope Library located on the uh, seventh floor of the Siegel Cancer Center. But if there's anything about um, oh, just general um, subjects, come and see us. And you can come and see us. We'll get you the books from Hope and Cope, or you can go to Hope and Cope if, if need be yourselves. Um, so that's our collection of books. Um, and then we have the website, which is jgh.ca slash pfrc. And I'm going to try to open it up now. It takes a little while. Um, and on our website, of course, all of the links mentioned tonight are on there. Um, we list um, the general health websites, we talk about Herzl, um, there are, um, here we go, um, we talk about our health information service, that's the patient information service. Uh, you can come to us directly, you can call us, you can send us an email, um, or as you saw in the video, you can have your physician do an information prescription and just come to the library and we're, we're there to help you um, search for whatever information you want. And I think what we can do is we save you a lot of time because if you're gonna go on Google, you're gonna get inundated with a lot of uh, hits and we want you, we wanna go to the specific uh, concerns that you have and we'll get you there faster. So that's our information prescription uh, service, health information service. And I'd like you to think of us as the drugstore. So you would go to the drugstore to get your drug prescriptions filled, and we'd like you to come to see us for your information needs. We also do this service on the Gynionc floor in the clinics um, twice a week. Uh, there's another librarian, Linda Lay, who is there. And she, while you're waiting for your, um, to see your doctor, there's a room with a computer, and she's there to go online and uh, help you if you want any information needs addressed. Uh, we also go up on the floors, up on 7 Northwest, or any of the other floors in the hospital um, that uh, we need to, that somebody might want to see us. And um, we've started to contribute to the JGH News, and the upcoming issue in the summer is going to feature um, a column on, not a column, but resources that we recommend on uh, heart um, health and digestive dis digestive disorders and like Dr. Lang said if there's any topic that you might want us to cover that um, we haven't thought of we'd be happy for you to recommend to us your suggestions as well and finally the disclaimer which you've heard several times tonight is that we're here to uh, help you we're here to uh, help you to understand and get information that you need we are not working um, to replace the uh, doctor, your visit with the doctor, but simply to, uh, to clarify your, your questions and, and get you better information. So we thank you, and uh, any questions, we're happy to answer. So don't sit down, everybody has to come up now, you'll have to answer questions. 
Am I on my mark? I'm on my mark. Okay. Okay. Uh, the first question is, how reliable is the information provided by Dr. Joe Schwartz in his new column in the Gazette? I don't know. It's for anybody who wants to dare answer it. Uh, Dr. Joe is uh, a, a very well-known and a totally brilliant uh, a scientist. He's a chemist, and um, I think he's done an enormous service to all Canadians in helping uh, people understand science. Uh, he does occasionally go into medical issues, but not commonly. And uh, we have, uh, he's, ha he's had me and Evra uh, on, our, on his radio show to discuss medical issues and to discuss evidence-based medicine. Um, I, I think his stuff is, is fantastic and completely uh, reliable. But he, if you listen to him, he's very careful not to get into medical issues per se. He won't usually make uh, specific medical recommendations or analyze studies and suggest what it means to you. So we're, 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 we try to make sure that our subjects don't overlap, and really, they never do. A case, uh, there was one exception. Uh, we did a piece um, many, many months ago about the potential dangers of vitamins, especially antioxidant vitamins like A, D, E, and K. And Dr. Uh, Schwartz, uh, is, Dr. Joe has also been writing a lot about this, obviously, and uh, has also expressed some concerns that the initial excitement about these vitamins is uh, probably a little bit overblown and that there is even a potential risk with, some, with certain vitamins. You guys have anything you want to add to it? I think you've covered it. Is that, is that good? Yes. Well, the, the second part of the question was, is he a medical doctor and is being a medical doctor an important criteria for relating medical information? Uh, my, my colleague, uh, Evra, who I write the column with is not a medical doctor, and yet she does a phenomenal job. R usually she writes the, the first half of the column, which is to kind of explain the disease to people, and I do the second half, which is to analyze the study and say what does the study mean for you and what you should do with the information. And so uh, I, I think, you know, we, we look over each other's stuff, we give each other feedback. I'm sure Dr. Joe would never go out on a limb on a medical issue without checking it, and even us, when we're dealing with a topic that's very specialized, as, I don't know if you've noticed, but we often get a special input into the column. So when we're talking about a cancer subject, we sometimes have, we send our column to an oncologist to look it over to make sure we get things right before it goes to print. Wait, I want to say something. I just wanted to say, I wanted to point out that there's a difference between advice and information. And um, as far as information is concerned, it doesn't have to be a doctor. It could be a medical librarian as well. That's why we're here. And um, uh, we're a nurse or another health professional. Um, exactly, not to discount, yeah, it's not just doctors. Um, but it's important to uh, realize that actually doctors get a lot of their information from other professionals whose job it is to help them keep informed. There's a lot, as you know, you get overwhelmed but also physicians get overwhelmed. And so we have a whole system of professionals, including uh, librarians, who are here to make sure that everybody stays informed. And as I explained tonight, there are um, ways of determining the quality of the information without getting into the nitty gritty detail of should I follow this particular specific recommendation for me, which is um, definitely something that you want to talk to your doctor or your nurse about. About blood pressure, uh, th this is a two-part or three-part, oh, it might even be a four-part question. <laughs> Get ready. Uh, which arm, left or right, and it, uh, I think the question is asking, is there a better side to take the blood pressure on? The answer uh, is, I think, I think some of the things to keep in mind is that the arm that you take the blood pressure on is the arm that it is easier for you to take the blood pressure on. So if you are right-handed and it's easier for you to get the cuff onto the left arm, you should do the left arm. If it's the other way around, it's the other way around. One thing you should 
bear in mind is that if there's a difference between the left arm and the right arm, uh, I think it's important to know about it. So at least at one point in time, have somebody check both sides to make sure that the same. But as far as I know, and I, I, I'm an emergency doctor, uh, not a family doctor, and I probably maybe should look this up <laughs> to be sure, but there, I don't think there's any real difference between the left or the right. I think more important is that you're comfortable with how you do it and that uh, it doesn't feel awkward to you. And it, I'd rather get, uh, it's, it's not so important what arm it is, it's that you're comfortable and that it's being placed on the arm properly. And if that means it's your left, then it's your left. If it's your right, it's your right. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think the other part of the question, Dr. Lang, was um, if you take it and there's a difference, why, why would that be? Uh, I'll just add one thing, though. If you go, you, there's probably lots of great resources oh, yeah, sure, that, yeah, that tell you exactly how to take your blood pressure mm -hmm. and can answer all of these questions for you. But there is sometimes differences, and usually it's not a significant difference. That, and, and what I mean by that is that if there's a difference in both arms, it's probably just the way that you're made and doesn't mean anything to be worried about. Um, however, in a small group of people, the difference in the blood pressure is actually something that could require further tests to find out why it's the case. And uh, for example, when patients come to the emergency department with chest pain, we almost always check the blood pressure in both arms because some conditions of the heart can lead, you know, during a heart attack or during a serious chest problem can lead to a difference in blood pressure. But it's not something I would be overly concerned about as long as your doctor knows about it from day to day. Um, I think that, um the uh, resources that were mentioned, the general interest ones, WebMD, Medline Plus, uh, Mayo Clinic, you could go there and just type in, in the search box, blood pressure, and you're gonna get uh, a lot of general, but information that might, uh, probably will answer these questions. Thank you, Arlene. The, ne the next one is as well related to blood pressure and asking, if it does monitoring both arms make a difference, and if there is a difference in the measurement, uh, which one would the doctor uh, base his uh, treatment on? Good question. <laughs> um, you, you know, usually there's not uh, that much of a difference. Or I, I don't know, Risa, do you know the answer to that? <laughs> no, we have, uh, we have some family physician in the audience. Um, you know, I think, uh, I, if I, there, there's rarely a big enough difference that it would matter to the this treatment decision. You know, I think what's very important in blood pressure control is how you're feeling. So, if your medication is making you feel down and sleepy and tired and dizzy, then it doesn't matter what the pressure is in the left or the pressure is in the right, what's important is that you feel good on, you feel as good as possible on the medication. So if that means that the right arm is the better blood pressure arm so that the blood pressure and the way you feel match together, then it makes, I think, a lot of sense for the doctor to rely on the right arm. If it's the left arm, make it the left arm. So it's, it's not about the side, it's about tolerating the medication, being compliant with the medication, and, uh, and, and, and monitoring it on a regular basis as we described in the presentation. So the next question and, um, is what is a good blood pressure machine for the home, uh, wrist, armband, other, and the second part of the question is should be, it be checked by someone occasionally and if so, by who? <laughs> That's a great question and I remember reading about this when we did that blood pressure column uh, ideally, you know, one of the ways that blood pressure monitoring breaks down at home and is, is less than optimal is that when you take the reading, it's often a little bit tricky to catch the numbers correctly and to write them down and to uh, transcribe them accurately from the machine. So if it's possible, they're a little bit more expensive, it may be useful to get a machine 
that actually records the, 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 the measurements and offers a printout and that way you know that you're giving a reliable number to your doctor so that they know how to make uh, uh, information. And by all means, as far as calibration, uh, go and ask, you, that's exactly what the pharmacists are there to do, to make sure that the machine that you have or that you purchase is working and they would check it against the machine that they use there, which is a, a, much, a very, very accurate machine to make sure that you're not getting false measures because as we know, if your blood pressure is being read as too low and your blood pressure control is not good, that can lead to heart or, or stroke problems in the future. And if it's reading your blood pressure as too high and your doctor is going to give you more medication when you don't really need it, it's going to make your blood pressure low and it's going to make you feel faint and, and, and potentially have a complication like a fall. And we don't want that. Is it absolutely necessary to have an information prescription to come and visit you in the library? <laughs> or can we ju is it possible to just walk in and make an appointment? You can walk in, and as long as one of us is available, we'll sit with you the second you walk in the door. Um, you can call. You can send us an email. Any of these questions, I would have liked very much to, to show you as we were talking some of the resources where we could find the answers to the questions you're asking tonight. Unfortunately, I was told that there's too much light so you wouldn't be able to see what I'm doing. But uh, we could do that if you came in. Um, we are also happy if you want to send an email with that kind of question because sometimes it's hard to come in, especially you know, to see us. Um, that we're happy to send you back some specific links, not just general resources, but specific links to information that answers those questions for you. Um, and uh, so yes, we're basically, we're here to help you in any way that is convenient for you, within reason of course, because we're not here all night, every night, and on the weekends and so on. But usually we answer emails within a few uh, working days. And like I said, uh, even this morning, I. I someone just walked in the door and had a question and in 15 minutes she had some um, printouts with her that she could take home and, and read about so okay, I'm glad I scared everyone <laughs> <laughs> to get your prescription information yeah. but I just want to tell you that this is something we use um, widely throughout the hospital with the health professionals so that they're aware of our services and that they can use it and and send the patient to to us um, so, uh, definitely you don't need it, and um, it's something that the team, the health professional team can use. Um, and there was one other thing I wanted to add. I might be having a senior moment, so I'll get <laughs> the mic when I think of it. Okay, so if you have any, I'm going to continue answering or asking the questions, but if anybody has any other questions they want to ask, just hold up your hand with your piece of paper and someone will, will uh, come by and get it for you. She remembered. She, remembered. <laughs> she doesn't need to see me in the clinic. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. um, when you come to see us, we do give you a printout of information. So what you leave with, as Francesca was just saying, is a printout. We cannot print out hundreds of pages, but usually enough so that you're, you know, we don't want to inundate you with too much information, but you will leave with a printout free. Um, and um, uh, so that's, uh, that's something that you can have. Or we send it to you by email. We can send you, if it's difficult for you to come to us, uh, we'll just send you, if you have an email address, we'll send you the links. And then you can always call us and we can discuss anything uh, if you're having trouble navigating that site. Okay. Um, for our librarians, how do I find an old article that was written up by Dr. Joe Schwartz in the Gazette? Um, how, like I said, unfortunately, I can't really uh, go through the steps. Um, it, I guess it would depend on how old the article was. The Gazette does archive things. I'm not sure how far back they go, and I would have to go digging in there. Um, it also depends on how much information you have about the article. Um, it helps. We, 
sometimes I've been able to find something even with maybe a partly remembered subject or title, but it helps to know a little bit um, what, what, is the, what, what was the subject, um, vaguely what year it might have been published, that sort of thing. So if you have any de as many details as possible, that would be great. Um, and, and then I would, of course, I would go in there and I would check out. I don't know, that's one thing that um, is, of course, impossible for us to know where every, de every specific item of information is. Um, however, what we know how to do is how to find it. And I, I really wish I could show you. I would very much like to do it right now, but unfortunately I can't. And I think Arlene wants to add something. Yeah, I just want to say that if anyone is going to take the time to go and do the research that needs to be done to find what you're looking for, that's us. So by all means, do ask your questions to us. And I just want to add also that we're very happy to show you what we're doing as we do it. So it's not that we're going to secretly behind the scenes um, magically find something uh, that you'll never be able to do it yourself. Uh, we do like to sit and show you what we're doing and go through it step by step so that you might be able to do it yourself the next time. Dr. Joe has his own website and you might want to start there to see if he keeps some of his uh, material online there. Uh, could you tell us which website for drugs is the best website to go to for drugs, side effects, and drug interactions? Okay. Um, I like drugs.com. Um, that's one of my favorites. It has an interaction checker, so what you could do, and it, it, it literally is drugs.com. Um, that's how you get to it. Um, bearing in mind that it's American, so it's better if you know the generic name of the drug, because if you use a Canadian name, you may not find what you're looking for. Um, so you would plug in the, the name. Usually, if I remember correctly, if you type in the first few letters, it will suggest the rest to you. Um, it's not on this list. Um, and it does have a drug interaction checker, which is very handy because you can plug in, I'm not sure what the maximum is, I've plugged in at least six or seven different drugs and been able to see whether there are interactions between any of them. It also mentions interactions with food, for example, which is something to keep in mind as well, um, with things like caffeine, uh, grapefruit has an effect on certain medications, that sort of thing. Um, it will also give you a link for each of the medications that you've plugged in. If there are no interactions, or if there are, it will also give you a link to the 532 drugs that do have an interaction with that particular drug. So that's very handy. Um, bearing in mind that this is a patient resource, so it's not necessarily going to have the most complete information. There are resources that um, health professionals use and that I use that are available. There are paid resources that pharmacists use as well to check in a uh, little bit more detail. But this is still a very reliable resource. Um, I'll just add that uh, Medline Plus again has um, a section which I showed you on drugs and you can check there as well and it's very, very comprehensive. Again, keeping in mind that these are American uh, coming from the US. And one other site that's good is uh, familydoctor.org. They, uh, they also do drug interactions, familydoctor.org. And if you want to look at uh, specifically Canadian stuff, the Canadian Medical Association also, it's bilingual, it's in French and English, also provides information on drugs. They don't have an interaction checker though. Okay, and I think our last question for, tonight to, for this evening, two-parter. Does doing the wonder wor word help to some extent uh, the effect of the onset of Alzheimer's? I hope so, because I do it all the time. Great question. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go research this, find out if there's any recent uh, high quality studies that have looked at this because it's a very interesting area. But 
from when when I when we did the column on exercise for preventing uh, for preventing uh, uh, Alzheimer's, the 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 current state of the research evidence was that the, the the mind puzzles don't as yet have any convincing proof that they will have that. It makes a lot of sense, and maybe as more research comes along, we'll we'll know a better answer. But right now, I don't think there's any solid evidence to say that those kinds of m mind puzzles or uh, things will actually uh, prevent the onset of uh, Alzheimer's. Can hurt. Good point. Uh, and the last question is, does having an excellent photographic memory prevent you or is protective against developing uh, Alzheimer's? I don't look at me. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know. Uh, it, it's you know we, uh, we we there are some things that we know. About things much much more that we don't. Yeah. And I've I've never actually come across that 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 photographic memory is protective. But again, like chicken soup, <laughs> it can hurt. I just want to add that if any questions tonight were not um, answered because we, we do have to look up the answers, please feel free to email us those questions and we would be happy to, to actually do the research and then send you the answer. And um, sorry, <laughs> sorry, our contact information is in the handouts. That's it. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and thanks very much for coming. We'll see you all next week.